The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. So we're here today with Aniset Tore, who is the product manager of SMRs and Advanced Technologies at Tractable NG. Welcome to Titans of Nuclear. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to talk to you about these marvelous things. Yes, of course. I mean, listen, I've known you for years. We've sat on panels together. So it's a real pleasure to be able to you know, have you all to myself for an hour and be able to you know, get to chat about, I think, what is probably both of our favorite topic in the world. <laughs> right. That's right. So, but let's start off by learning a little bit about you. Where did you grow up and how did you get into the energy space? Well, I grew up, uh, well, first of all, I'm Belgian. Uh, so I, I grew up uh, nearby the, front, the, 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 the border of France. Um, with, uh, well, uh, actually a nice family. My, my, my dad is from, uh, from Africa, from Mali. Mm. Uh, so I, uh, I grew up with him for, uh, for a few years. Then he went back uh, in Africa and... Uh, yeah, it was quite a journey. I mean, you know, how old, having, were, you? How old were you when you were in Mali? Uh, no, I, I was I was never there. So I lived okay. in uh, in Belgium my whole life. I see, uh, I see. But he, he came here to study, uh, met my mother. And uh, yeah, that's how I came about. Ah, got it. Great. Uh, and what did he study? Was he an engineer as well? Uh, he's an architect. So not not far away. But actually, my my passion for engineering come from my grandfather. Um, he was, uh, well, he learned engineering, uh, in the army. Uh, and yeah, I mean, when my dad was gone, um, my dad was gone when I was nine years old. Uh, so, you know, my father figure was, was a little bit my, my grandfather and we spent a lot of time, uh, playing with computers and so on. And that's where I get into, got into engineering. Yeah. Amazing. And then when did you begin to study and what was that process like? Well, actually, I um, so initially I wanted to become an astrophysicist. So that was my dream when I was probably 14 years old. I was like, yeah, I want to do hard science and basically uh, do equations to calculate how the stars move. Um, then when I was a little bit older, I realized that I wanted to do something with a real impact uh, in the world. Um, and, you know, Doing equation on a blackboard doesn't exactly fulfill that uh, that vision, so that's how I got into engineering. Um, and in the mix between my passion for physics and engineering, I think energy, especially nuclear energy, was uh, the right and obvious choice. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's like it's the it's the type of engineering I think. Yeah, anyone who just gets a little bit mesmerized by you know how it almost takes you to a different universe, right? Yeah, it's got some new rules of physics. I mean, still the same type of stuff that we're all used to. You know, you know, basic equations. But then all of a sudden, there's some like orders of magnitude differences that I can really like capture the curious mind. Yeah, that's that that's for sure. And and I think you know. What's crazy about how I got to study um, nuclear engineering is that I started uh, my, 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 my specialty in nuclear uh, engineering in, 2020, uh, in 2010. Uh, so right before Fukushima, my first year was during the Fukushima accident, which is kind of amazing because in a sense, you get to learn about nuclear engineering in another way. And, you, you, you get to think about things differently, but at the same time for a, a young man uh, going through this, you, you really question, is that what I really want to do with my future? And in the end, um, 
I think this is how I really came. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that I want to do my career in nuclear engineering because of that, because I looked into all of the aspects of, of nuclear waste, safety, everything. And I'm pretty convinced that nuclear energy is, is, is actually a great form of energy. It's safe. Um, and when you get to know things in the details, you realize that people are afraid of it because they don't know uh, it that well. And yeah, I'm, 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 I'm really convinced that this is what got me as passionate and as dedicated as I am today. Yeah. And um, just one more second on this, because, you know, I wasn't in the industry during Fukushima. I can only look at it in hindsight, and that maybe has informed, you know, my beliefs. Um, in the moment, what did your professor tell you guys was happening? And, and oh, and you probably had a couple different professors. So was there, were there differences where some saying, listen, you know, this proves the safety because nobody got hurt. And others were saying, well, we have to wait a few years to see what really happens. What, what were the different conversations? I think I think there were there, there was a bit a bit of both. Um, I definitely remember one of my professor who was like really analytic about the accident and how things went down. Uh, you know how the tsunami uh, flooded uh, flooded the diesel generators and so on. So we, we we got to learn about I would say all the, the backup systems um, which you normally don't do traditionally into the, the, the course of your uh, nuclear engineering training. I mean, it, that comes later on in even uh, probably when you are in the job. So that was really interesting. And it, it, it took it, some of them took it as an opportunity to teach us about what, uh, what was going on, what, is, uh, what are the safety systems in a nuclear plant, and also how are the plants operated worldwide in Belgium can be different from the from from the Fukushima plant. So for sure, that was, there was a bit of of interest from from that point of view. Now I also had course in uh, you know what are the impact of uh, the the radiology the radiological impact of uh, of an accident, and this was really interesting because there people were yeah we we need to wait a couple of years to know exactly what was the impact uh, yet. We do see that it's very. At the same time, there was already this this feeling that this was a very different accident from from the Chernobyl accident and was not of that magnitude at all, which was kind of the feeling in the media landscape. If you if you look back at it. And after you completed your studies, I mean, was it a foregone conclusion that you'd work for Attractabel? I mean, that's one of the largest companies in your country, right? That specializes yeah. in nuclear. Or were there other? Where did your class? Did your other classmates go different places or? How did you transition into the workforce? Well, that, that's a great question. Actually, uh, yeah, I think I think Tractable and, and the Engie Group were quite an obvious choice uh, because they have a great uh, nuclear traineeship program where you get to learn about you know practical stuff about how you operate a nuclear reactor and you go on the field, you you really uh, see things hands on. So uh, I think. Starting a career in Belgium in nuclear energy is this is the place to go, uh, and so yeah, for sure, um, it was. Um, I, I wanted to 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 go there. At the same time, uh, the first year I applied, um, I was a little bit late, um, and so because of that, I had to do one year uh, where I did uh, basically I supported uh, a PhD thesis in in economics. Uh, so applying Monte Carlo tools, but to a uh, complete all over field, that was really, really interesting. And, and, and I must say that um, at the time uh, I had the interviews with Practable and I, I knew that there was an opening there for me if I was willing to wait for one year. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I was pretty confident that this was the right choice and, and I was learning so many amazing things on the side that yeah, it was an opportunity that I couldn't miss. And what does Tractable do? For those who aren't familiar, especially with the European context of nuclear, walk us through. What, what is this organization? So, so Tractable is kind of the engineering branch of the Engie Group. So and the Engie Group is a worldwide big, uh, big company, utility operating about 100 gigawatts uh, of, of assets in the world. Um, and they own also the six gigawatt of nuclear uh, of power plants uh, in Belgium. And so in Belgium, I would say Engie is divided 
well, in, in, in many uh, sub companies, but the, the two most important ones are uh, Electrable, which is the operator of the nuclear plants, and Tractable, which is the uh, historically speaking, the architect engineer of the plants and now the responsible designer. So really handling all the engineering. And for example, we were busy with the design upgrades uh, after the Fukushima accident, the lifetime extension of the plants and so on. And um, tell me about the history of nuclear in Belgium. I mean, it's a, it's a small country. I know you've got, I've walked around, so I know you've got these beautiful palaces. How did right. it get so much nuclear? <laughs> Well, it's, it's actually a great question. I mean, um, nuclear energy in Belgium uh, became a topic really early on compared to the other, to uh, to, to the other countries. I think uh, the first pressurized water reactor uh, to, to produce power in Europe was uh, operated in Belgium, was the BR3. Um, and this is because, uh, but I don't know how to, if, if we need to be proud of that or not, probably, probably not so much, but um, Belgium at the time of uh, World War uh, II was um, one of the country provided the, the uranium uh, to the Americans. And so in exchange for that, we received uh, uh, yeah, civil nuclear technology. And so this is how it started very early on in the, in the 60s. And uh, in the 70s, one, during the, the old crisis, uh, Belgium decided to invest massively in nuclear energy. And so uh, we built several nuclear reactors uh, in about 10 years. And they provided up to 50% of the electricity in Belgium for, yeah, about 40 years. So Amazing. Quite a feat. And does that mean that the, the, does the public sentiment you know, recognize the value that it's created, all the clean air, the stable electricity? Do people know? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And I mean... It depends when uh, when you would be asking the question. Uh, I think in so in, in 2003, actually in Belgium, uh, the Green Party uh, came into leadership and they decided of gradual phase out of nuclear energy from wow. from there on. This was revisited a couple of times. Uh, I think Fukushima, the Fukushima accident, cemented that reality. In, into the minds of people, especially because Germany, which is our neighboring country, was doing it so uh, so obviously as well. Uh, now, in 2015, this was rediscussed because, you know, the question is, the, the very big question in Belgium is, how are we going to move on from nuclear energy okay. without going back to fossil, to fossil fuels? Because right. basically, there is no, I mean, there is a bit of wind in Belgium. There is no, not so much sun, as you can see right now. I'm, in a very dark places, this just because the sun coming from the window is not so not so uh, not so much. So, yeah, um, and 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 this is what strikes me as a challenge uh, that we do face in Belgium, in, in Europe, and, and worldwide. In fact, is that when you look at the place uh, fossil fossil fuel occupies in the worldwide energy landscape you realize that you need all the assets that you can to, to, to get to zero carbon, which is, which is really the goal. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the plan in Belgium, uh, unfortunately, is, has been shifted a little bit away from that. I mean, the, the political discussion right now is, as is the case in Germany, to boost the presence of, uh, of renewables, but to do it with a partner that, as of right now, is gas. We are trying to to see if there is still an opening for that, but that's that's the reality right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, just kind of like the tug of regional politics. And I, I mean, it's just hard to imagine, you know, I'm not from Europe, but just to see so many, uh, so many countries that had so many successful stories. I mean, you guys have as many reactors combined as the US does, so to see, to see people want to phase it out. And especially when you have all these like, you know, different, you know, these cultural differences, you would hope that there'd be one or two countries. And there are, I guess, you know, some in Eastern Europe that you know, really stick up for it and say, no, 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 you guys have it all wrong. But it does seem that Germany has this like undue influence, which I just think is just so crazy. 
at the same time, it's a little bit counterbalanced by the French example, on the other hand, which is the country most reliant on nuclear energy in the world. Um, and yeah, I do think that there is this dual view, uh, which is not that easy. And, and it, in my opinion, it's there because uh, the public is a little bit misinformed about, about yeah. nuclear energy. And, um, you know, I started this interview uh, with you by saying, well, I learned about Fukushima and that convinced me that I was to do nuclear energy. People don't understand that. And, yeah. and, and, and this is what's the most crazy thing about, I don't know how it is to be a nuclear engineer outside of Europe, but in Europe and in Belgium, for sure, when you're sitting in, at a table, uh, dinner table, well, I'm a nuclear engineer, you always have that weird look like, but why are you doing that? I mean, uh, <laughs> are, 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 are you, people see you as an, as an evil person, which, yeah. is, which is kind of crazy. And what I'm, yeah. I'm saying, and I've managed over the years to debate, even with people from the Green Party, uh, I have a couple of friends working there, uh, and to say, well, I'm really convinced about it. I, I do think the reason why I'm working for uh, in the nuclear industry right now is because I deeply believe that the world needs nuclear, nuclear energy to succeed in its uh, energy transition. And people don't really understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. But I mean, some of the things that you were saying were just like, yeah, classic engineer mindset. You know, you just get to look at the facts, you know, be analytical about it, change your mind if you read different facts. But yeah, not, every, not everyone takes that, um, that same analytical approach. But OK, so tell me, you know, as you kind of you know, started you know, moving in on your career, um, how did you take, you've taken like, you know, some real, um, like deliberate choices, like you specifically to become very involved in the SMR space, the advanced technology space. I mean, I see you putting in the extra effort. I see you around the world. Like I literally run into you in this country, in that country. So how did you decide this was going to be the thing that you were going to, you know, take some you know, young leadership action on? Well, actually, when I started at Tractable, my first assignment was uh to review a technology watch study on smrs so i fell in smrs when i was really really young as a as a as a nuclear professional um and from the onset i was really convinced that there is something interesting about what smr are um i think i met the right people so with intractable you know we have so many great experts and and people where you you, you can ex have exchange with and they will tell you th their opinion about the concept and from from the get go i realized that um there is something behind the business model of smr that is really attractive uh i felt like people in the industry didn't were not putting the right word on it mm. and so my journey on smr started from that Started from, I, I, I was trying to understand why I was so deeply convinced that there is a kind of beauty behind it. Yeah. And in the end, uh, over the years, I, I, I materialized that, um, that thought into um, the reason why I believe so much in SMR is because it is a business model that starts from the right questions. Yes. Ah, oh, you are speaking my language now. Okay. So tell me, what are the right questions? Well, I do think if you look at the global energy landscape, because the, the right questions are not exactly the same in, in every country in the world, but if you look at the global energy landscape, uh, I usually put them in four categories. The first one is how do you recreate trust in nuclear safety again? Because I don't think it's a problem of nuclear safety we are facing. It's a problem of stress of nuclear safety. <laughs> and you need to be able to tell a different narrative about how nuclear safety is achieved, how, it, it, how it's done. And I do think SMR brings something on the table that is, that is really amazing, going from more inner and safety. So not trying to engineer solution against the problem that you might face in case something goes wrong, but trying to make sure that Nothing can go wrong in the first place, which is it's it's a great it's a great mindset. It's a great approach. Um, the second question I would say is um, how can nuclear energy play a role in the zero carbon transition? And for that to be a, a reality, I think um, the 
the mindset that has changed is that nuclear energy, uh, I mean, SMRs at least, are not any more base load generation that don't really look at what's happening beside their own power production, but it's more becoming something integrated into an energy ecosystem. We've built in flexibility to complement intermittent renewables with the ability to decarbonize uh, industries with process, uh, process heat and uh, with hydrogen. Those are the kind of questions that SMR are addressing to say, well, we want to be part uh, of the fight against climate change and we need to be thinking about in what environment are we going to, to evolve. So this is one big difference. Then there is the question of why going small in the first place? And I feel that the industry misunderstand, uh, the industry as a whole, not people working in SMR specifically, but misunderstand the point. I don't think that going small has to do with real better economics or, or, or anything of that nature, but just because when you look at nuclear endeavors right now, there is no more private actors, and there really never really was, private stakeholders in the world that could afford a nuclear plant. But we know that the, the, the world energy context is that, at least when you look at, at Europe, there are more and more private, uh, private stakeholders in the energy market. And so you need to make, um, to de-risk uh, the, the nuclear endeavor, the nuclear projects. We've seen, uh, we've seen Westinghouse uh, struggle just because of, uh, of the difficulty of building the AP1000. That's where SMR gets, gets things right, I think. Uh, going one, one of the magnitude below in terms of uh, capital investment. Yeah, I think that's that's really the goal. And then, of course, there are all there there are all those ideas of how you streamline delivery, how you modernize them, or how you make an, you you make them built in more at least in factory than than on site construction. But this is to get back, uh, I would say, the economies of scale that you lost in, in economies of mass. The the real the real benefit is because you are going to de-risk the projects, you are going to pay lower. Um, return rates at the bank, and in the end, for such capital-intensive project, that's where you're you're going to to regain the margin. I believe. Wow. Okay. Yeah, you said a lot of important things there, <laughs> um, and I, I like I want to unpack them because I mean, so yeah, you just went through so many things. I think that all of them are so important. Like you laid out a bunch of good cases for SMRs that aren't necessarily the obvious ones. You laid out being able to, you know, to shift the narrative. You laid out how the market of electricity itself has changed. You laid out how, um, how there is this advantage of economies of scale that you can make up for when you do. And listen, everyone knows you're going to lose something when you go smaller in terms of the efficiency of your system. But you can make things up. Uh, in terms of a quantity of production. And then also that last point that you touched upon is from de-risking from the capital perspective as well. So I, I just wanted to kind of highlight those things because I think everyone who's interested in this space needs to like, uh, like really dive into each one of those things pretty deeply to understand you know, where these many advantages are coming. It's not just one, it's like you just laid out four serious advantages there. Um, now, how did you, uh, that, I mean, it was just so well articulated. How did you come across this information? It, I know that you guys published a big report recently. Was it that like you were instrumental in, in putting together this report and you just like really took these things to heart? How did, how did you discover these advantages? So um, it's, been a, it's been a process. So basically, um, you know, if, 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 I, if I start back from the journey on SMRs with Intractable, um, so my first, my first study on, on SMRs was in 2015. Um, about 20, 2018, I, I went to my management and said, well, look, we really, we really need to investigate um, SMR as a, business, uh, as a business case for Tractable in the future. And, and really from the get-go, because we have such a great management structure, really open to new ideas, they were like, okay, go, go for it. Um, kind of prove us that, there is something there in the market. So we have a small team of, uh, of people who are actually the people who wrote this, this white paper, the rise of nuclear technology 2.0 that you, you were talking about. Um, we started deep diving a little bit the concept of SMR, looking at every aspect. And what, uh, what was really the strength of this is that we built it on people who were 
we were not believers of SMR. We were like, SMR is not something that is going to work. And the process was, yeah, you say that, why, why are you saying that? I mean, why, what, is, what is it in the SMR business model that you think is not going to work? And we were starting from that point, trying to go through, but again, trying to ask the right question and, and doing studies, basically market studies, uh, technical studies on SMR to see if those worries were, were right. And in the end, uh, I think about after spending two or three years uh, tackling every of these issues, we were like, well, there is something real there. And if we can, now the, the, the question is, can we get stakeholders of the energy market convinced that this is the solution they need? If we can do that, there is something, there is definitely something that is going to happen and a revolution that can be centered around renewables, SMR, and other solutions, but where SMR would be an integral part. And so where does Tractable play into this? So first, literally, what would you guys do? Would this just be engineering services for SMRs? And then uh, the second question would be, what is your responsibility in terms of convincing these other stakeholders, like industrial you know, uh, purchasers of energy? Like, it, does Tractable see that they have to both create the market to also serve the market, or just talk to enough SMR players so once they sell their systems, you guys can come in and, and, and help them perform at the, at the best they can? Yeah, I think, I think there, there, there is a little bit of that. So if you look at the SMR market right now, especially if you are looking, if you are looking at Europe, there is a couple of projects only that are in the starting blocks, and and I wouldn't say that they are even far. So um, the market as it is doesn't have uh, there is not much uh, money or or business to be made in SMR as we speak, and so one of the belief we uh, we developed, especially with the core team, I was uh, I was talking about is that we need to create the market. It's not about sharing a small pie, it's about making the pie so much bigger that there will be, there will be enough for everybody to eat at the table. And, um, and in the end, I do think that this is something that the, the nuclear industry has to, uh, to realize is that it's not about fighting against each other. I mean, the, the real, enemy uh, right now is, is, is fossil fuel. Is the, I mean, I, I know. It's, uh, it, and it's just so crazy. And like, I saw this in my previous industry, the drone business, where like, there's so much, especially when you introduce a new technology, your biggest challenge is actually customer education. It's, it's, not, um, it's not competition on any given uh, individual contract. And so it is just so important. I, I cannot stress this enough for the uh, for the various vendors, like get on the same page, you know, uh, work with each, not, you don't have to work with each other directly, but like help each other succeed, help break down roadblocks together, because that'll create a huge market. And even if you're not the best technology, just by creating a huge market, the slice of your pie is going to be better than if you went off and just did it on your own. Yeah. Definitely, and so that's 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 why we started. Uh, I would say canvassing stakeholders outside of the traditional nuclear market. Actually, we are also going to uh, to industrials right now and saying, well, you you need to decarbonize your footprint by 2030, 2035, 2050. Yeah. What are the solutions that are out there? Have you considered SMRs? And um, what are your requirements? Look, we are going to look with you. Uh, what can SMR bring to the table? And that brings me to the, the second question you were asking, which is, uh, what's the role of Tractable in all of that? Um, yeah, indeed, we are an engineering company providing engineering services. Um, I, I would say that Tractable is a, is a bit of a weird beast in the nuclear industry because, because we were the architect engineer of the nuclear uh, power plant and working so close to the nuclear operator, which is from a sister company, uh, we've really developed competencies across the whole um, competencies that you, you would find uh, in a nuclear engineering uh, company. And, and that goes from even things that are normally more uh, found within vendors themselves. I mean, we have competencies in, in, in core and fuel studies, uh, which, is, which, which is quite rare for engineering company. And so the idea is really, yeah, um, how can we help stakeholders bring that market about. And I do think that uh, on that note, there are two type of 
of, of clients that we are that we are helping. Or, I mean, they are the vendors who need engineering uh, to get them past the finish line, or at least uh, get them advanced their conceptual design up to a, a detailed design, and and incorporating that into a supply chain. This is definitely something that we've been. Uh, that we've been doing and for which we can help. And there are um, utilities or future operator owner of the plant, uh, which don't always know how to build a nuclear plant. And this is for me, maybe the most, from a conceptual perspective, the most interesting case. You have industrials who say, well, okay, your SMR business case sounds interesting, but our, our core metier is not to operate a nuclear plant. We are producing whatever goods uh, we, are, we are producing. Um, how can we build a model where uh, basically the, the plant is going to be operated or to be built without us to have, we, we, we are okay to invest, but we don't want to operate it. And we are trying also to, to, act, to, to go with those, with those stakeholders, to go with those industrials, think about, how uh, the business model around nuclear energy can evolve uh, in this concept of SMRs. Amazing. Can we talk about some of these industrial stakeholders? Can you maybe rattle off a few industries that either you guys have spoken to or that you think might be applicable for this type of technology? Sure. And, and I, I do think there are a couple of people that we've, that, that we've met uh, also together at, at a couple of events. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, a well-known uh, industrial in the in the rubber industry is is looking at SMR. Uh, I think there is a, an interesting thing happening uh, in some of the countries in Europe where basically actors are are seeing the the energy market evolve, and industrials uh, are seeing their roles and themselves evolve uh, with the market and saying, well. We were a consumer of the electricity market or the heat market. What about being prosumers uh, in, this, in this market? What does prosumer so mean? Pro Define that for us. Producers and consumers at the same time and having kind of a, a, an hybrid role because you play such an inherent part of the, of the market being such a big consumer that if you have your own production that can also serve some of the challenges like uh, balancing the intermittency of renewables, this is a win-win situation for everyone. And, and I think the, the, the realization is that um, the integration of the market is going to, be, to, to, to become more and more uh, profound. It's, the market has become to be more and more complex with different solutions really integrating themselves and not something adding up on top of the other and a grid operator uh, doing the dispatching. So that's, that, that belief has changed. And I think we see it in the nuclear industry. And we see also other actors. Uh, one um, that I'm very proud to work with is, is Fermi Energia. Uh, well, actually, you, you, you did have a, an interview of Kalev Kalem as their CEO yes, on, on your podcast. Yes. Um, yes. No, we're very proud of them. You know, we were an investor in that company as well. So we're, we're very proud of the work that they've done. This is for me maybe one of the most um, brilliant company to work with uh, and brilliant people to work with because they have this same vision that we have in our core team that uh, we need to change the energy market. Uh, they are they're, they're, they're thinking ahead of, of everyone and, and basically want to set up that first of a kind project SMR uh, in Europe. Um, and we are really glad to, to be part of their team to advise them also because, well, we know that building an SMR is on paper, it's, it's a great adventure. Uh, when you're doing it, 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 takes a, it takes a whole lot of skills. And so building uh, that with them, but with vision and with the drive of a CEO like, uh, like Kalef Kalamet has been a, an amazing journey. And so, yeah, there are a couple of other companies the, the, the unfortunate thing is that because companies in Europe are still in the phase where they are looking at it, but trying to see what's happening, uh, you know, on the on the European Commission level, for example, with questions such as the taxonomy and what what is about uh, uh, sustainable finance, will nuclear energy be included in that? Uh, how nuclear energy will be perceived in the near future? I think there are a lot of actors that right now don't want to 
to publicize too much about the activities there, but we have more and more uh, stakeholders saying, well, SMRs look really promising and we are going to, to go step by step, uh, seeing if, uh, if there is a market, if there is, uh, if there is a business case, if, um, and if we see that all, if, if the licensing is possible, and if, if we see that all those uh, steps can be, can be fulfilled, well, we are all in, uh, all in for SMRs, and, and that's quite great to see. Amazing. So can we talk a little bit about economics, though? What do you think that the uh, SMRs have to be able to produce electricity at to be competitive? What do they have to produce heat directly at to be competitive? You know, I think at the end of the day, it's great to engage these stakeholders. Yes, they definitely see benefit. Okay, great. But at the end of the day, I think when they need to convince their boards, it comes down to dollars and cents. I think yes. you're going to be very hard pressed to find an industrial stakeholder that is willing to do it just to advance the industry and is willing to take a loss on the first unit. So where do these SMR vendors have to come out on in terms of dollars per megawatt hour in order to really make their case? Okay, so that's, that's actually a great question because I do think that from an investor point of view, if you can produce electricity at $50 per megawatt hour, then everyone, everyone will be saying, Yes, let's do that. Is the solution uh, we, we need? We need to. Well, go fifty for is it. very competitive. Fifty is what you'd need to compete on the grid itself. I thought you would say a much higher number when it comes to industry that has to pay for it at the end of the grid. I was, I was, I was getting there. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no worries. I beat you in the pod. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you know fifty is the obvious number. Fifty yeah. is where. Uh, you start having the discussion and saying, well, okay, how can we align on this project? When can we make it happen as soon as possible? Yeah. Um, now, the reality is also that uh, I think production costs, which is tradition, the traditional measure of, of energy costs uh, everywhere, is not the right metric mm. uh, to study SMR. And of course, it depends on the market you're, you're considering. So I'm going to talk of the electricity market for a minute just uh, for, for me to be able to exemplify what please, I mean. Please take your time. Um, I think on the electricity market, what you see, and we, we've, we've done in, the, in this white paper, the rise of technology 2.0, an analysis that shows that um, basically production cost in tomorrow's energy market is not the right metric anymore. Because when you have a lot of intermittent renewables on the grid, which is going to be the case, and it's already to some extent the case uh, in country like, like Germany. Um, or California. So, <laughs> yeah, or California. And, but it's, it's, it's a really good example because in the end you see that um, there there is a hidden cost, which is the cost of storage, the cost of transmission, and the cost of distribution. Yeah. And we've looked at that, and we've looked at SMRs with a specific angle with, that was, if SMR can be flexible enough, and there are different ways to achieve that, uh, hydrogen is one of them, heat storage is one of them, you can also uh, down ramp and up ramp the power. Um, if you can be flexible, then you bring something really interesting to the, to the market. Because in the end, you will decrease the, 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 the storage and transmission cost of renewables. So basically, you are going to improve uh, the, the profitability of renewables as well as you are um, producing, uh, making a competitive offer yourself. What we, sh what we showed in our study to make it specific uh, is that basically at $70 per megawatt hour, uh, you're not competitive with uh, wind, onshore wind, for example. But at the same time, if you model the whole market and the whole aspect of cost, so production, storage, distribution, transmission, you see that the system from an economic point of view will reach the optimum by investing more in, uh, in flexible nuclear than in onshore wind because of those, of those costs. So I would say that 70, um, 70 is, is kind of the right metric where you see real benefits. And beyond that, it just depends on the flexibility uh, merits that you can reach. Uh, I do think that, you know- so, But just to, just to be clear, I just yeah. wanna pull this out for a second. Are you saying that um, 
at 70, even if you didn't, let's say you don't have hydrogen, you don't have heat storage, you don't have down ramping involved, can a new can an SMR still be competitive at, at let's say $69 per megawatt hour just by uh, selling direct to an industrial player? Um, I would, the, the answer to that question is unfortunately complicated, but for the sake of simplicity, let's say yes. Okay. And um, then beyond that, you're saying with all of these extra things, it depends on the situation, of course, on, on you know, where the electrons are coming from and how the grid is set up and how the market forces are aligned. But even beyond that, there's a possibility that it still makes economic sense. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. And okay. in fact, what, what I was trying to, to get at is that with simple flexibility, and by simple flexibility, what I mean is basically what the French nuclear reactors are capable of doing. Uh, 70, 70 is, uh, is, is basically a good, uh, a good target. If, if you're trying to consider things like heat storage solutions, like, uh, I don't know, Moldex Energy is doing, like uh, TerraPower is doing, um, those kind of things have such an interesting value in highly intermittent uh, driven grids that you can reach costs that are beyond that. Obviously, I wouldn't recommend for anyone. I mean, it, at this point, what becomes really difficult is not the overall business case, because the business case, when you look at the macroeconomics, okay, it can make sense. But what are you, as an individual investor in a specific project, going to, to get from that? It, that's where things becomes, become a bit more complex. Now, I want to come back on what you were asking about uh, things like, uh, I would say, an industrial uh, that would receive that power. Because then, um, sorry, um, because then um, you're starting to consider something completely different, which is if you're producing, for example, uh, hydrogen, uh, as a byproduct or as a main product, depending on, on, on the industry you're, you're in, um, then you, you, you have a business case that, that completely shifts. Because you can say, well, I'm going to produce hydrogen base load. And when the price of electricity reach high value on the market, which is definitely going to happen and, and is opening, happening, uh, regular, more and more regularly because of the, the pace of renewables, then you can sell your electricity to the grid. And these are business cases that make sense, but we will need time to convince uh, the, the market stakeholder that this is where the market is going and there is a business case. It, here, I would say we need to go into the details. We need to go into the specific business case uh, to make it happen. But at least, let's say under, seven, under 70 at least, uh, you can be pretty confident that there is a good business case to be made. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Okay, um, any other industries? I know we talked about chemical, but just so people can like brainstorm and, and think a little bit more, can you just rattle off a few more industries that might uh, make use of SMRs? Sure, uh, actually there are, there are quite a lot. I would say uh, the chemical, uh, chemical industry in a large sense. So when you see the chemical industries, there are most... Uh, sometimes organized in chemical clusters where you have plant basically sharing a cogeneration mean and, and using the steam and power. Uh, this is something where we have a lot, uh, we, we see a lot of potential for, for, for this industry. And in, in fact, what is also um, quite curious in a sense, or might, feel, might seem curious when you look at it from the outside is that I do feel that the, big, the petrochemical industry could benefit from SMRs. Oh, for sure. Not necessarily to produce, uh, you know, the old, uh, the old fossil fuels, but to produce synthetic fuels. And that's the future. Uh, that's the future. Yeah. If they're not thinking about this. They're crazy right now. Yeah. I, I do think so. And, and, you know, the reality is that there are applications for which it will be very difficult to replace uh, the fossil fuels. I mean, uh, if you are thinking about um, airplanes or boats or uh, even uh, trucks, uh, long long range transportation, basically. Well, you do see that it, it is really difficult to go towards something else. And so those synthetic fuel ideas is something that we do believe 
uh, can be a game changer, but synthetic fuel are are only a game changer if you can produce them with low carbon energy. Because if you're producing synthetic fuel from, from gas, power plants, it starts off making less sense. So uh, SMR are a good candidate for that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any others? Uh, steel comes to mind, data centers. Oh, sure. Yeah. Steel, um, steel is also a very good business case because uh, through the, the, the process of, um, of, of DRI, which is a specific way to produce uh, to produce steel. You could actually produce steel with hydrogen, yes, uh, as a feedstock. And and I and again there, uh, if you look at it, uh, I do think that nuclear is perfectly perfectly fit for that. And I have a number to to, to give you an idea. Paul. Well, um, we we looked at it in Belgium. If we were to replace uh, the steel production of Belgium, or one of the largest sites in Belgium, in Ghent, uh, through SMR producing hydrogen and, and the DRI uh, process, it would represent probably about one gigawatt of SMRs, uh, one gigawatt of electrolyzers. That's a cool market. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great market. And at the, you know, at the scale of Belgium, this is meaningful because uh, the whole uh, electricity market in Belgium is about 10 gigawatts. So it means that there is something, uh, there is something there. And it's the same thing if we are looking at, we, we also did something which is kind of a crazy exercise. What if uh, we were to replace all the synthetic fuels, uh, all, I mean, all the fossil fuels produced in the port of Antwerp, so in Belgium, uh, by synthetic fuel produced through SMRs? Yeah. And then you, you cannot even believe the numbers beyond uh, beyond 50 hundreds of billions, power. probably. Sorry, hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe. I mean, oh, yeah, <laughs> easily. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's 50 gigawatts of power, it's just it, it's, it's crazy numbers. So, there is a market big enough. Now, the question is, can we convince these the, the actors to go there? And I want to share something with you. Um, that was told to me by some people working, uh, within the European Commission. They were saying, well, we see a place for nuclear energy. Uh, in the current context, uh, the current political context, it's not a simple discussion to have. But at the same time, everyone right now is focused on uh, reaching the targets for 2050, uh, 2030. So basically, in, European, uh, in the European Union, it means reducing carbon footprint compared to 1990 by 55, uh, by 55%. But getting there is only part of the problem because when you're considering that, you can say, well, let's replace coal by gas. That kind of works in the equation, but it doesn't work on Long the term. overall equation yeah. of climate change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when you're really trying to get to zero carbon and that's your objective, even people within the European Commission say, well, we need to consider uh, nuclear energy at some point, and we are glad that some of the countries are doing it. Yeah, I, I think Bill Gates made that point in his book. He like very specifically called out. He said like, watch what like your final goal is. If you just aim for the twenty thirty targets, you might actually make technology selections that actually make it harder to get to your twenty fifty targets if if you don't think long term. So I thought that was right. very very smart that he called that out. Um, quick question on um, Belgium as a potential first market, since we've been talking about it. Is, is it a possibility? Could a first of a kind SMR get licensed in Belgium? Is there, is there a regulator that's equipped for it? At, at this stage, I don't think so. Um, and why not? Why couldn't they just borrow expertise from a, like what they call a TSO, a technical support organization? No, I, I, I do think that the, the, the capability is there. So uh, I, if you are looking at the safety authority, the TSO, uh, the whole nuclear industry as it is built right now, it is capable of doing that. And in fact, um, the, the Belgium nuclear industry has been a pioneer in nuclear engineering uh, from, from the very start. I mean, it's been, a nuclear, uh, uh, it's been an industry that has uh, greatly contributed to the development of uh, fuel reprocessing, uh, we were one of the first country to uh, to look at our geological disposal. Uh, I mentioned the first EPR. Uh, we are now uh, looking at transmutation with our research center. The, the Belgian research center is looking at transmutation with uh, with uh, lead fast reactors. So technically, we are equipped. Uh, the question is that 
the, the current political context, in my opinion, would, wouldn't allow that. Uh, we, we might come back on that later on, but I do think that there are other countries in Europe that will be uh, you know, the market initiators and where we see things moving forward first. Which ones? For example. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, well, Estonia is one of them. We mentioned Kalef uh, but Estonia, a bit yeah, But Estonia is still further off just because they don't have the experience. Yes. I was hoping you'd say something more like Czech or something that has a bunch of nuclear already. I, I Are was, there other countries? Yeah. Yes, I was, I, I was going to get there. I think... Uh, Czech, uh, Czech Republic, Finland, uh, Romania are countries that are uh, already equipped with nuclear power that are seriously considering uh, the SMR option. Uh, I do think also the fact that we are seeing France with, uh, with a new world initiative move, moving towards SMR um, is quite telling because it means that they see a shift happening uh, there. I don't know if you can consider it uh, Europe or not anymore, but the UK is definitely a good candidate as well uh, to, be, to be a groundbreaking country. And there are even some uh, less expected countries. I think of a country like the Netherlands, uh, where the, the discussion around nuclear energy is, is really shifting. Uh, and yeah, they might probably not as a first of a kind because it's still a small nuclear country. They have only one uh, nuclear reactor at least one uh, that is operating and producing power. Um, but yeah, they're considering for the future. So maybe as a second or third of a kind beyond, uh, behind countries like Czech Republic, um, Finland, Poland, uh, yeah, for sure. Great. Uh, tell us about Horizon 238. I know this is something you're proud of. So I just wanted to make sure that we spend a little time on it. Sure. Um, well, Horizon 238 is something that I launched, uh, I would say, outside of my professional activities, because I wanted to you know, relaunch a debate uh, about nuclear energy uh, in, the, in the broad uh, public domain uh, in Belgium. And that's because I feel like when I look at debates uh, on television, I feel like the, the way nuclear energy has been debated is, is not the right approach. Uh, you know, it's, too much about um, either renewable energy bashing or um, or even just uh, having this th that position where you're saying, well, um, nuclear energy is good, and we are not really going to explain you why because you're not able to understand why. Uh, yeah, oh, and, I hate that. Yeah, yeah, that just doesn't work. I mean, and and we wanted to do something different and saying, well, I personally am convinced that. One of the reasons why nuclear energy, the nuclear industry and nuclear energy is, is in such a bad spot uh, in the public debate is because for too many years, we've not been willing to talk about nuclear energy because we were saying, well, it's, it's, it's secret or it's confidential information. Yeah, we I don't know, want I to. I know. I hate so, that attitude. Yeah. I see it all the time and I hate it. Yeah. And, and, and basically that's, that's how Horizon 238 came about with different people from different companies in the nuclear industry. We are not talking about on behalf for any of the uh, nuclear industry stakeholders, just in our own name. And I'm trying to, to share a vision where we're actually thinking of the real future of, of Belgium energy. So not trying to look only at how to boost renewables, but actually increase the carbon footprint but trying to make a plan on the table where renewable can work with other um, renew, uh, low carbon energy sources to get to the goal, uh, to think about the real question of the transition and to go beyond uh, you know, the, the, obvious, um, the obvious question within the political debate uh, and, and public debate in general. And, and also I think, uh, about educating uh, people about how a nuclear reactor works, uh, how does uh, spent fuel handling and spent fuel management and spent fuel uh, storage works? Because those are kind of things where people will, will easily say to you, well, um, I'm against nuclear because what about the waste? But if you're starting to have that question, that conversation and, and say, yeah, what about the waste? And, and really starting to, to get into 
what's being done, how much volume is uh, represented with, what's the level of, of, of danger, what is, what is radiotoxicity, how do you compare it to other things? I think this is where you, you really get to a point where you can really have a, you know, a normal conversation with people uh, where you can say, let's think together about our future. Let's get on the, uh, on, on, let's start the conversation uh, with the belief that I think that you're, you're being sincere when you're saying uh, you want to get to zero carbon and you want a better uh, environmental future. But let's take the other approach and let's say, well, we are being sincere. And this is why we founded Horizon 238 with young engineers. Because you know the whole idea was we have those, this incredible team of young engineers that are really passionate about their job and that chose to get into nuclear energy, even though they knew that the law in Belgium uh, would probably, it was probably not the best career choice uh, if, you, if you wanted to have a long future in Belgium. But they were so passionate that they wanted still to be in this in this field in this industry right. and and fight for it. So yeah, That's great amazing. great team, great spirit, and good fun. And it's a great name too, by the way. I have to compliment you on that. I think you know one thing that I've really learned to appreciate about you specifically, as I've talked to you more and more, is that you're an engineer, but you seem to have like a very good business mind as well. I don't know if that's something that's natural or something you've been working on over the last couple of years, but I think it's just like a superpower of yours that I that I've really <laughs> enjoy. Thanks. Well, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly. I think that it's something that I try to work on, uh, specifically because, you know, I've always said in the back of my mind that it's not about only building technical solutions, but uh, making an impact. And and I do feel that engineers uh, tend to shy away from that, saying, "Well, our job is techniques. We don't want to get into the business stuff and so on." But at the same time, if you're not the one doing it, uh, you're letting some other people who might not be as knowledgeable as, as yourself do the job and you might miss something in the, in the process. So I'm trying to get to learn from people who know about business and, and, and communication because it's, it's also part of the job uh, if you look at the nuclear industry state right now. And you said, as we, as we wrap up right now, I'm hoping you can just leave us with your vision for the future. If we were to look forward you know, 10, 20 years, what does the world look like? I think... Um, the work 20 years away from now um, looks like, um, first of all, a realization that uh, we need to fight climate change with all the solutions possible, that includes nuclear, and I, I really believe that. Uh, and then we start building about how to integrate renewable into a global energy landscape, not only producing a base load electricity, but flexibility electricity to complement renewables. Uh, producing high temperature steam uh, to feed our industries, um, producing low temperature or low or uh, medium temperature water to feed our cities with, uh, with, with district heating, uh, and, and producing hydrogen to, as, as a feedstock for, as a feedstock or as a synthetic fuel for all those industries that will not be able to decarbonize. I do think that if you look at the future, um, I have a very integrated vision of, of the, the, the energy landscape of tomorrow, where uh, when you're a nuclear engineer, you'll, be, you'll need to work with people from the renewable industry, from people from the industry, and where you get to touch of a, a bit of everything, because if we don't connect all the building blocks, I'm not convinced that we can really uh, succeed in the, in the zero carbon transition. Aniset Torre, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, it's a pleasure we're shared. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the invite. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.